Good afternoon and welcome. Hopefully your lunch is sitting well. Mark Lewick, I'm the CISO for EMEA at Zscaler. <clears throat> and I'm hoping this is not the height of conceit, but I'm in front of you today really just to kind of tell a joke. And it's really bad because it's a joke you've probably all heard before. But you know those two guys are sitting in around a campfire in the Rocky Mountains and they're cooking up some, I don't know, sausages or something like that. And they hear some rustling in the bushes. And out from the bushes, 100 yards away, comes a mad, hungry grizzly bear. And it is charging towards them. And one of the guys sitting there, he goes down on his knees and he starts praying. And he's thinking of his wife and his children. And he's really just waiting for the end. And the other one straps on his trainers and starts legging it. Now, the first one says, as he's starting to go, he says, what do you mean? You can't outrun a grizzly bear. You've all heard the punchline. But the point is, you don't have to outrun the grizzly bear. You just have to outrun the guy who's sitting on his knees, right? So the key here, why does this have any bearing, any resemblance to cybersecurity? Well, we have been fighting the grizzly bear since this industry started. So I've been in this industry now for 25, oh, yeah, 25 years uh, in security. And I have been working and trying to fight that grizzly from the beginning. And we had a set of of rules we played by. If anyone recalls this, um, by the way, this is a 20 minute presentation. I'm squeezing into 15, so forgive me for speaking a little quickly. <clears throat> so if anyone remembers this uh, from 1984, and the key was, and this is the first instance of the use of the word firewall pretty much anywhere. If you remember, he was going and logging into a system. He thought it was all a game. He thought it was fun. And the quote was, can we get to the deep logic? No, we keep running into the firewall. This is a very odd circumstance where reality followed art because firewall was not really used in that way. And then suddenly that became our tool to fight the grizzly. And that's almost all we had. Like I said, I started really being security focused in 1995. And that was the tool that got me into my, my job, got me in my career. I was a path and I have installed more firewalls than you can imagine hundreds over my life. And I regret almost each and every one of them because what was I doing? I was trying to fight the grizzly head on. And what were we doing? It was 83, by the way. What were we doing? The firewalls were simply our, our battleground. When they, it was started out as a packet filter and we found out that the attackers found a way of getting around our packet filters. Okay, we're going to add antivirus in there. They found out a way. It became this seesaw, this crazy mad game that we were never winning. We were just catching up. And you all know what I'm talking about. You've all seen that we have to fight smarter. We have to be better. We don't want to play on the attacker's game. We want to do things differently, right? <clears throat> and what we've done is our one major tool we had. Okay, I'm skipping endpoint protection, but let's avoid that for the sake of today's argument. The one tool we had, we were building complexity, we were building capability, we were making it more expensive, we were making it harder to, to utilize, we were building choke points into our environments, we were making security a pain in the posterior for, our, for people. What we weren't really doing is outrunning the grizzly. So I think, oops, even more, I think every presentation in cybersecurity should have a Sun Tzu quote. I think actually I've just notched up our, our daily presentation requirements today. The greatest victory is that which requires no battle. Normally I got a monitor and I keep forgetting my quotes. That which requires no battle at all. In other words, the best way to fight those bad guys is to not have to fight at all. And how do we do that? Enter the attack surface. So what is the attack surface? Well, classically you're gonna be thinking, well, that's what I've got exposed on the internet. I'd like to suggest it's a little bit bigger than that, a little bit wider than that. But let's talk about why the attack surface is important first. In the old days, back when I started in 95 and, and all I had was a firewall and some endpoint stuff and that was pretty immature as well, trust was really, really simple. There was the bad stuff out there on that network that I had a UUCP dial up connection to, to get to and there was the good stuff inside the network. And there wasn't a, much of a crossover. Bad, good, trust, no trust. Everything inside here was good. Well, then things became a little more complicated. Oh, we've got mobile users with uh, RAS, you know, remote access services. And we've got uh, a network we've got, that's connecting to other buildings. And oh, how do we do that? Maybe we'll have a, a VPN from this other location. Suddenly, the idea of trust started to become eroded. And yet, we still had our same tool. We got the firewall. As long as you're on this side of it, everything's cool. Because we're still trying to fight that grizzly head on. 
But don't you think they were figuring this out at the same time? They were figuring out that our, our landscape had become incredibly complicated and it was no longer possible to simply trust one item and that would suddenly inherit trust everything below it. It didn't work. And then, in about 2012, the bottom totally fell out. Everything changed. The internet, instead of becoming this thing you did on your lunch break, became where business was conducted. The stuff we had on site wasn't just that server in the back room that people connected to. Suddenly, it was a vast swath of communication. It was doing everything everywhere all the time. And the internet was the, the lifeblood of that entire process. But what did we still have? I'm not bashing firewalls, by the way. They do have a place in this world. But what did we still have? We had that one tool. Everything behind it is trusted. Everything outside of it is untrusted. It's fighting a losing battle. The Grizzly is clearly better than us, better than that architecture. So let me look a little bit deeper. I said before, I said what attack surface actually was. It's wider than this as well. But attack surface is things like unprotected endpoints. Don't just look at TLS surface. There's a person. When they were behind your firewall, you felt safe, didn't you? But they're not behind your firewall all the time anymore. They go home. They're taking a corporate asset home. That's part of the way the world works now. Are they protected? Are they part of a new attack surface? Yes, they are. What about servers that you've got exposed that you're providing access to? I mean, I don't want to pick on VPN, but I'm going to pick on VPN. VPN is an example where it is exposing itself to 7 billion people on the internet so that you can provide access to 5,000 people that you know. That doesn't compute in my head. There's a problem there with that. It's a tax surface. Servers that you're providing, access, your mail gateways, all of those things become, become a tax surface. Is it necessary? And the way I divide this is, as I say, I need to provide something on the internet. Am I using the internet as a transport medium for people I know, or am I using the internet to provide that access to the great unwashed masses? Well, you should be thinking about that in every case. And bad actors can ex find instances of your public usage, your public cloud environments, your public or, or your available environments that you aren't even on site anymore and you are protecting them in different ways, but this is still a tax surface that can be leveraged and attacked. And finally, even your namespace becomes something that they can leverage to understand how to attack you better. So attacking and fighting the grizzly head on with the tools we had has become more and more impossible more and more difficult and less and less satisfying. I remember I was quite satisfied with the tools I had at the time and no longer. So what do we do? We thought with our firewalls we had security. We thought our perimeters in place and then we had our VPNs to so bring that person inside. They're really inside. They're not. They're in their bedroom. They're not inside your environment. And yet we thought we had this secure environment. What we actually had, and I love this picture, it reminds me of my home. <laughs> what we actually had was a, a jalopy, a mess, a, an incredibly mixed up environment with more holes than walls. And yet, because we were thinking about fighting head on, we weren't actually thinking about the problems we were exposing. We were significantly at risk, and we still are significantly at risk. So what do we do about it? Let's go dark. Let's think about how not to be available. Let's think about what is possible to hide. Let's think about only exposing those things which are supposed to be for the 7 billion people. All right, there aren't 7 billion, but they're close. Let's, let's look about splitting those into two camps and not providing the internet as any part of our security mechanism and looking at it differently. Now, there are those of you in the room thinking to yourself, yeah, but... That's not, you know, outrunning the grizzly uh, by outrunning the lowest common denominator of, of attackers. That's not perfect. That's not. And you're absolutely right. We will continue throughout my career lifetime still having to spend effort fighting the grizzly head on. I get that. This isn't a perfect solution. However, when all the CISOs I've spoken to for years, I'm just going to get the basics and I'm going to be okay. Then we'll look at another investment or I'm just going to uh, double down on this, on this capability in my architecture and try to get these, these controls better. I think we're missing the point. The point is we need to look at the fight differently. Fight where we have to fight and avoid where we can avoid. 
So how do we fix it? The first thing is to shine a light on our exposure, to look at what we are providing, what our attack surface actually is. Now there are tools that you can buy that do this. There are capabilities uh, out there to go and, and give you constant, that's by the way, not something we really do. <laughs> I'm talking about this as a capability, but shining a light is your first step and making that instant decision. Is this something that I'm providing to my people? Is this something I'm providing to the greater wider world? Those are two different problems and two different solutions. If something has been provided to the wider world, yep, you gotta double down and fight that grizzly. If you are providing something to your own people, the internet should be plumbing, not part of your security model. Your perimeter is doing nothing, think about it in a different way. So what I really think we should be doing is looking at the challenges different, looking at the problems different. Now I don't know how I've done in my 15 minutes, I have spoken quite quickly, so maybe I've even gone faster than I thought. Is anybody keeping any time? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> so I'm just going to keep going. <clears throat> so what I really think we should be doing in order to, to challenge ourselves and look at the problems of, of actors differently in the future, and as uh, the, the, the previous uh, person on the stage was saying, this is the future of cybersecurity, is not necessarily think about controls and keep piling capability. And by the way, there is great capability going into the control space right now. There is incredible stuff uh, happening. We are getting better, but so are the attackers. What I would suggest is looking at things differently. Instead of trusting IP addresses, which is what that firewall was fundamentally about. And yes, we've added capability, but it's really about, I want to trust an IP address. We should trust identities, be that an identity in a machine, an identity of a person. We need to shift trust. This is shifting from implicit trust, trust because it exists, to explicit trust. Trust because I know and I can validate. We move from trusting networks to trusting platforms or applications. Move from trusting servers. Sorry, I've covered myself here. Trust, moving from trusting a server to trusting the applications that are resident on the server. Reducing the control, reducing our attack surface, reducing and going dark where we should. If we're providing access to a network to somebody, why are we providing access to a network? Let's think about ad, uh, providing access to the resources they need. These are all ways of reducing your attack surface because attack surface isn't just on the internet as well. You have an internal attack surface. When a, when a, when a compromised machine comes into the network, how are your firewalls helping you now? So it's about understanding that communication and security can be achieved in a different way. It is about moving from implicit trust, trust because I put it in there five years ago, trust because it's a piece of metal that I can touch, trust because I built a career on firewalls for 12 years and that's what I knew, to moving to something else, trust because I, have I can test it, trust because I have constant context, trust because I can see and understand and apply risk-based uh, policy, you know, risk-based policies rather than rules-based policies. This is a shift. This is a shift. Yes, technically taking things off of the internet that don't need to be there. Yes, it's a shift from taking a network as your architecture is trusted because I've got some controls to saying, no, I don't trust anything. I want to make sure I can reduce that attack surface and only connections which are appropriate are allowed. This is a major shift of philosophy. And you can apply this. This is my mandatory technical slide. You can see how technical I go here. <clears throat> you can you know, start to look at moving away from site to site VPNs and move to using plumbing to connect these things in appropriate connections. Virtual firewalls moving to using, plum using the, the, the trust broker in order to, to broker these kinds of sessions. And what we talk about is our zero trust network architecture, which is a nice Gartner term <clears throat> about utilizing that trust broker service in the middle of all your connectivity to ensure that that attack surface is reduced to the minimum possible. So like I said, I did try to get as much content of my 20, 25 minutes uh, into 15 speaking quite quickly, but I have three takeaways for you to, just to, to remember. So first of all, attackers attack what they can see. And like I said, I'm not so, uh, so um, naive to think that there aren't state actors out there or there aren't really sophisticated actors out there who aren't waiting to see your attack surface. They want you and they're going to find something. I get that. That is the facing them head on and you do need these controls. However, for a vast swath of attack types and of, 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 of malicious actors, they are going for bulk. By removing yourself 
and reducing your attack surface, it is an extremely efficient way of reducing the potential for incidents. Secondly, understand what that exposure looks like. Understand what your tools are doing rather than what you think your tools are doing. Your existing architecture, the architecture that I spent many, many years of my life perfecting was part of the problem. It wasn't actually a solution. It was just what we had. So think about these problems and challenges differently. Act like an attacker and think about what can happen once you're acting like an attacker. And third, reduce. Reduce, reduce, reduce your surface wherever possible. Make that decision point. Am I providing this to my, my staff or my people I know? Or is this to the great, greater unknown? In which case, if it is the greater unknown, yes, it's got to be there. If it is not, make some better decisions. So thank you, everybody. I'm hoping you're also pleased this is not a pitch. <laughs> this is a discussion about what we can do. Yes, I hear, see a question. Uh, assurance, I would expect, considering this is like a third of my job, I'll answer you with an informed position, <clears throat> I would expect a lot of certification and I would like, expect them to be able to prove that that certification is valid and that the scope covers exactly what it is you want to see um, and that it is not, you know, an ISO 27,001 uh, 27, certificate for broom covered operations. That would be one, that, it, that that certification is valid, covers your services. Second, I would want to see constant testing of that. That was an interesting sideways question, but more than happy to answer that one. Any other questions? Question Go on. Did you have any problems keeping the Russian nodes up in your architecture? Was it a moral dilemma? I was just going to say, are you asking that about a, from a moral stance or a technical stance? No, Both. <laughs> it, it, our, our, we do have a Moscow data center. We, ha we have a Moscow data center. We've always had a Moscow data center. I, can't even, I don't even want to share you how we got a Moscow data center, but it's there. And um, we did have, uh, in, the, in, in the events 500 days ago or whatever it was now, a, a decision to make whether we keep that data center up and running or whether we exit um, that region entirely. However, Two things happen. Zetskiller, first of all, does not have a Russian business unit and does not actually have any Russian customers. <clears throat> we only have international customers that operate in Russia. Some of those customers are providing life-saving things. I mean, I'll give you an example. It's a public reference. Nova Nordisk has a presence in Russia who are providing insulin, and I don't necessarily think that it's an appropriate decision for us to take um, a to, to exit that center, con considering the first two obligations we had. But it was a moral decision we had to come to. Thank you. So that comes to the end of your time. Wow. Mark, dead on time. Thank you very much indeed. Great presentation.